as Brother Jonathan has just ministered to us, this, the 8th chapter of Romans, is one that expressly clarifies many important aspects of salvation. It firmly establishes the confidence of the believer and the unfailing nature of the salvation that is in Christ. These are words which are solid, words which are meant to strengthen the faith of those who heed them. Mm -hmm. In this first verse, we are confronted with a bold affirmation that there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. And in verse 2, and continuing into my text tonight, he begins to open up more fully what is involved in the removal of condemnation. If the saints are going to be able to properly fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, they must be aware of the implications of Christ coming in the form of a man and laying down his life. Right. Redemption is not simple, therefore the exposition of it cannot be simple either. Yeah. No one can come away from seriously considering this text with the idea that the salvation of mankind is in any way, shape, or form a simple thing. Mm -hmm. The divine economy is such that the one who wishes to participate in it must have an understanding to be able to do so. Yeah. It is to the degree that we take hold of the truth that is presented in this text that we will be able to confidently and boldly move forward in running the race that is set before us. Now, as we have just heard from Brother Jonathan, Paul has established in the last verse that through the leading of the Spirit in Christ, the believer, the believer is able to operate independent from the defiling influence of the sinful nature, which brings one into the bondage of spiritual death and separation from God. And as he moves on in our text, Paul continues to unpack exactly how this came to pass. Mm -hmm. My text is in Romans Eight, chapter, or verses 3 through 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now first, brethren, we're going to talk about what the law could not do. Although God ordained and divinely appointed, the service itself, itself existed of outward rituals and outward service. It consisted mainly of things that men do. Carnal ordinances, as they're referred to in Hebrews, the covenant then, being primarily an earthly covenant, could not address the greater spiritual problem that plagued the human race. And there are certain things which the law could do. The law could convict men of sin. It could provide a basic outline of the character and nature of God and what was required for men to approach Him. However, there were also some very important things which were lacking. Namely, it could not take away sins and it could not cleanse the conscience. Yeah. And Hebrews 10... Verses 3 through 4. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Mm -hmm. These sacrifices then did not actually atone for the sins of the people. We should be careful to note, however, that the sacrifices under the Old Covenant were not ineffective or pointless. They were just not effective in taking away sins. They did serve a purpose and were effective in completing the purpose for which God instituted them. However, due to the carnality of the priests and the lower nature of the sacrifice, it could not possibly be the means by which the guilt for man's sin would be remitted. Also, it could not cleanse the conscience. Yep. Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 2, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices that were offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worship once purged should have no more conscience of sins. The sacrifices that were offered in the tabernacle were not actually able to cleanse the conscience of the people, because these continual sacrifices for sin could not pay the atonement that was required. Every year on the Day of Atonement, when the priests went into the Holiest of Holies, it was a remembrance of sin, always. Yeah. Amen. They did have the desired effect, and that was to sanctify the people and save them from the wrath of God. These sacrifices were as a reminder to God of the sacrifice that was to come, an appeasement for Him to have long-suffering on the people until the actual Day of Atonement would be made. Amen. Mm -hmm. So then the law was not sufficient to bring men into God. However, it should be seen that this is not an inherent flaw in the law itself. Directly Amen. after stating that law, the law was unable, Paul adds a qualifier to the situation and that it was weak through the flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 8 8 through 9, for finding fault with them, 
he saith, yeah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Man was unable to fulfill his end of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Israel's relationship with God depended directly on their ability yeah. to perform what was required. This is why the covenant wasn't effective in taking away sins. This is why the covenant was not effective in bringing man to God. The covenant relied on man. Mm -hmm. The condition of mankind was one that was so severe that it would take much more than merely pointing them in the right direction. Knowing what is wrong and what is right could provide no power to the people to effectively choose to do good and refuse evil. For inherently they wanted to do what was evil. The situation required much more than the law was able to accomplish. However, as we continue in our text, we see that this is not where the situation was left. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God. With one word, our attention and focus is instantly averted from the inadequacy of flesh to the strength of a sovereign God. In the case of humanity, this is what makes the difference between salvation and utter destruction. God. Amen. The purpose which was purposed in Christ by God himself from since the foundation of the earth and redeeming man and bringing many sons to glory is being fulfilled. In the statement of the covenant in Hebrews 8.10 he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with them in the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their members and write... Or I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Notice how many times in this text it speaks of what God will do. I will make, I will put, I will write, and I will be. We see what a stark contrast this is to the law. In the Old Covenant, God told man what to do and promised to bless him if he did. If you keep my commandments, he says, this do and live. In the New Covenant, God told man what he did. The Gospel itself is a message of what has been done, not a commandment of what ought to be done. Amen. Even from the beginning, it was determined that God be the one to initiate the work of salvation. We have countless words throughout Scripture that communicate the intention of God to do something about the condition to which man had fallen. It's remarkable when you go back through the Scripture how many times it speaks of what God will do. Even as far back as the promise given in the garden in Genesis 3.15, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Mm -hmm. And to Abraham in Genesis, he says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. Uh -huh. This is something that God did. Yeah. He prepared it, he predestined it, he developed it, and he performed it. Amen. God. Amen. Now, this is a truth that brings the ultimate comfort and confidence to the believer in Christ. This is a strong bulwark to the faith of those who are in Christ that produces a blessed sense of assurance in one's soul that God saved them because he wanted to do it. Yeah. Amen. And who better to meet the need of humanity than the one who defined humanity's need? Mm -hmm. How confident can we be of the surety of salvation's completion if God is the one who started it? Yeah. Amen. So God... Now what did God do? God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Mm -hmm. well, firstly, I want to go over sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In this small statement, we see in what capacity Christ would appear in the world. Something that dawned on me as I was looking more deeply into this, is that this text directly contradicts the idea that Christ was in any way a creative being. God sending Mm -hmm. The idea is that he moved from one place to another. He mm -hmm. was dispatched, so to speak, from the presence of the Father to come to the earth. Mm -hmm. Even from a language standpoint, it's a rather ridiculous thing to suggest that you could send something that, not, not, that did not exist prior to you sending it. Uh -huh. To send something, you must have something to send. Mm -hmm. Also, he sent his own Son. Mm -hmm. And no one other than Christ is ever referred to in this manner, his own Son. It's a similar in fashion to His only begotten Son. It is a term that exclusively belongs to Christ. Amen. The saints are called in Scripture the sons of God, but this is only realized in their connection with the one favored Son. Mm -hmm. Even the Pharisees and the doctors of the law at the time of Christ's earthly ministry recognized that Him referring to Himself as the Son of God was essentially His claim to deity. Mm -hmm. However, He would not send Him in the full capacity of His deity. 
Jesus would submit and be humbled. For God to be able to accomplish what the law could not, Christ would have to be a man.